هذا القرآن يوحدنا لطريق الخير يوجهنا الله تعالى أنزله ورسول الله معلمنا الحمد لله our speakers here despite some small uh, minor ailments and Allah سبحانه وتعالى we ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to cure him and give him shifa and reward him for taking time out of his busy schedule for coming here. Our distinguished guest today for this session is Dr. Muhammad Al-Ghazali, who is the head and professor of the Islamic Thought Unit at the Islamic Research Institute. The Islamic Thought Unit is involved in the study of Islamic theology, comparative religion, sociology, and political science. Alhamdulillah, our distinguished guest is also the editor of the quarterly Arabic Islamic research journal called Ad-Dirasat al Our speaker today will be talking about the topic, The Polished Gems. It's an interesting title for a very interesting talk. There's a Chinese proverb that says that the gem cannot be polished without friction, nor can man be polished without trials and tribulations. We all like to be the best of creations, the best of society, and until we go through trials and tribulations, can we only achieve that greatness. And the predecessors of our predecessors, the Prophet ﷺ and his companions of Allah did achieve that after going through those trials and tribulations. Specifically today, Dr. Muhammad Al-Zali will be talking about Umar al-Faruq also, we have our distinguished Dr. Naseem Ansari, who is the CEO of the Shifa College of Medicine and has been very instrumental in helping us organize this conference, has been listening to us day in and out. We go into his office even though he has to attend two phone calls at the same time. Whenever we went in, he would be welcoming us and helping us out in organizing this conference. So I would request Dr. Ansari to also join us on the stage as a chairperson. Without further ado, I will give over the mic to Dr. Muhammad al -Zali. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه المعين First of all I must apologize very sincerely for the delay and the inconvenience caused by the delay and since all or most of you appear to be connected medical profession I hope you will appreciate my my apology. Uh, I was asked to speak about Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab and at the same time some questions were formulated which I suppose I am expected to answer in the course of this talk. Why are people in distress today? How do we bring about the same peace today as in the first Islamic society? What would the companions have done for resolution of modern world issues? And light and moderation, the companions say, concept of the Ummah in, in, in the modern world. But I would like to focus on the first two or three questions because these in my view, if addressed properly, would ipso facto lead to the resolution of all important issues including the very fundamental issue of unity the followers of Islam. To me this unity lies simply in the fact that the basis that unified the society of the faithful in the best of times, in the golden era of Islam, if you ponder and reflect a little bit, then it was the firm bond and the strongest link of love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet. 
So the formula would be whenever and wherever our link, our relation, our bond, our commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is stronger then automatically we share the same love, the same feeling and the same temperament with all those others who enjoy this relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if you reverse it if our link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is weak then our mutual relationship will be automatically weak just like in a family if we are related to our parents in a strong and sincere bond of relationship and reciprocal love and affection then we will love our brothers and sisters and love all those with whom we become connected through our parents. So the key to unity lies not in creating you know different organizations or writing manifestos or making plans that will you know come by itself but the real basis and foundation is how to how to reach how to recapture how to revive that love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the present distress, anxiety, chaos, internal and external, al fasad fil barri wal bah, is in my humble view, is because we are distanced from our real self. What is our real self? A self enlivened with love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, I'm not saying it from myself. The Quran speaks about this love. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ Those who have faith, they are the strongest in their love of Allah. And the test whereby we can examine and assess the intensity and depth of our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is how far we have ordered and organized and changed and conformed and adjusted our feelings, our responses, our actions to the model pattern of the Prophet. Qul in kuntum tuhibbun Allah Say, declare if you love Allah if you are sincere and genuine in your claim that you love Allah and this love of Allah you know is, is, is given is a corollary of faith the Quran does not argue before saying that if you love Allah, that you should love Allah and this is the benefit of loving Allah and this is how it is necessary. But it takes for granted that by saying La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, we have been initiated into a process, a lifelong process, an unending process, an infinite journey, an infinite interminable voyage of loving Allah and mind you this this relationship with Allah will continue beyond this world even in Jannah you know in Jannah there will be this progress of love progress of proximity progress of knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beholding the radiance the jali the nearness, the presence, the company, 
for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those who want really to have a feeling of how paradise is going to be, the best way is to experience and intensify the experience of loving Allah here. Because if you define Jannah in terms of this world, it's very difficult. And the Quran says in absolute terms that لَيْسَ كَمِسْلِهِ شَيْءٍ فَلَا تَعْلَمُ نَفْسٌ مَا أُفْيَ لَهُمْ مِنْ قُرَّةِ أَعْيُمٍ No soul knows what is in store for it in paradise. What pleasure, what bliss, what gratification, what fulfillment, what perfection, what realization has been reserved for us in paradise. But the crux of that bliss is love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know those who have experienced love of any kind, ishq haqiqi or ishq majazi as the Sufia would classify, know that the real aim, that the real urge and craving of a lover is meeting the beloved. So that meeting of the beloved will take place in paradise eventually and ultimately, inshallah. But it can be experienced partially in this world through inculcating, through intensifying, through remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, we are distanced from this self. And that is the reason of all distress, all anxiety, all chaos, all discord in the society. Because quite naturally, if we truly love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we pursue that love, because it is not a static state, it is not a rigid uh, condition. It is a dynamic situation. It is a dynamic process. It is a constant development. Then we naturally will look for the ways that lead further to the higher stations in that path of love. And then we will love the Prophet who is the example of love of Allah and who is beloved of Allah as well. So we will love the Prophet. And when that will happen, quite naturally without any extra effort, we will love all those with whom we share this love. You know it is a very common uh, knowledge that if we love something of this world and anyone else shares that love with us, we become his friends, isn't it? So, but if we, if someone loves somebody and we don't love that somebody, then that relationship of mutual love will never take place. The present civilization you know, which has a heavy influence on all of us, you know, has tried to teach ways in different, you know, inventions, in different forms of development that it has introduced, ways of seeking happiness outside of ourselves. We look always for sources of happiness or rather pleasure outside of ourselves. Whereas the real seat of happiness, as Dr. Amin and, and those you know who share his specialization would fully endorse and testify that the real seat of happiness is inside man. 
and this inside of man can never be at peace with itself unless he or she becomes linked with the Creator and the potential, the, the ability to achieve relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to the Quran is already impregnated, is already rooted in human self, human soul. When afakhtu fihi min ruh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has breathed into man his own spirit. So that potential is there with everyone. But if we neglect that potential, then we will not be able to develop it. Just like any other potential of human self, if you neglect the potential of knowledge and inquisitiveness and do not struggle to, to acquire knowledge, that potential will be lost gradually. Every human being has a potential for healthiness, healthy mind, healthy body. But if we neglect that potential, we will not be able to achieve health. Every human being has potential of being a scientist or an artist or a statesman or a manager or a singer or a leader or a public speaker a poet, but if he does not struggle and activate those hidden latent faculties, after some time these are lost. So the highest faculty or the highest point of perfection which human being can reach, is capable of reaching, is establishing his link of love or rather retrieving or regaining or reviving that vital cord. What happened in the lives of the Sahaba that from that life of barbarity, savagery and ignorance violence, discord, division, internecine wars and conflicts within the short span of I should say 13 years or 23 years we have these men Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, Ali as we know the Arabic word the Arabic term for those Muslims who lived at the time of the Prophet and who had the honor of seeing the Prophet in the state of faith is Sahabi. So here lies the again another key to solve this present problem of distress and anxiety that if we want the shortest way to achieve love of Allah, love of His Prophet, nearness of Allah, then we should seek those who have already achieved this love and remain in their company. Suhbat. And the Quran says, Ya Yulazina Allah. وَكُونُ مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ O men of faith, be identical in your desires, in your discretions, in your urges, in your endeavors with the will of Allah. This is how I would translate taqwa, not just fear of Allah. Fear of Allah is only one of the facets of the comprehensive doctrine of taqwa. <coughs> so, 
establish an identity between what you feel, what you want, what you desire, and the will, the revealed will, concretized in the life of the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then it says, وَكُونُ مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ And be, be truthful. My late sister, you know, she died four years back, she was younger to me. And she uh, did a lot of good work. And she never went to a school. But she studied at home, memorized the Quran at home, and learned Arabic at home, and learned English and many things by herself. Somehow my late father, Rahimahullah, was not in favor of sending daughters to schools, right or wrong. So she struggled very hard and she became uh, an expert in the Quran, in Arabic, and she spoke and wrote books and articles in English, Urdu, translated a number of books. Her name was Azra Nasim Faruqi. She used to teach ladies Quran at her home, and perhaps she completed ten times the whole of Quran from beginning to end and taught it to hundreds. So she used to sometimes, you know, come out with ideas that are not found generally in the books of tafsir, in commentaries of the Qur'an, because if you reflect the Qur'an uh, seriously, then the Qur'an reveals itself to you and reveals new facets, new nuances and new messages. In fact, the Qur'an is is, is a message for all, but it is also a message exclusively for the individual who is reading. So remember, the Qur'an has many levels of comprehension. And one most important significant level of comprehending the Qur'an is the individual faithful who pursues the Qur'an, who pursues the message of Allah, with the spirit and intention that it is a message meant exclusively for him. Then you will see new meanings are revealed. So she uh, reminded me one day that look here the Quran says Ya and the Quran commands only those things that are possible. Like Quran also says that God does not charge a soul beyond what it is capable of. So when it says do this, it means it is possible. It would never make us responsible for something which is not possible. So it says, Kuru be with the truthful, be with the pious, be with those who love Allah, who pursue. Haq, al-Haq is an attribute of Allah. So this means that in every age, despite all deterioration, all decline, all those things that we complain of every now and then, it is still possible to look for people who are worthy of our company. So this is number one step to overcome the stress, anxiety, and all those problems that are begotten of the malady of our negligence to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the companions, you know, they achieve what they achieve through the company of the Prophet Sohbah. You know, the Prophet did not establish uh, a university on the pattern of Jamiatul Azhar or Oxford or Cambridge or Sorbonne. What did he do? He enabled the companions to live with him, to experience with him a life, a thought process, a, an attitude, 
and a way of responding to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly and you know Hazrat Umar how a sudden change took place in his life and you remember the story of his embracing Islam he came out with the intention of killing the Prophet and someone met him on the way and asked him Umar you seem to be in a very hostile mood what are your intentions he said I am going to eliminate this whole thing going to kill Muhammad Naudu Billah and he said before you do that you take care of your own home he said what happened he said your own sister and her husband have become Muslims so Omar in anger you know redirected his steps towards his sister's home and he went and he became very violent towards his sister and when he entered her home she was reading Surah Paha Paha ma anzalna alika al-Qur'an li tashqa and Umar insisted that she should show him what she was reading and her sister was also sister of Umar you know not an ordinary person said you are not pure you must first purify yourself so he took bath and then she allowed him to read and when he read he heard his, his life change he was a different Umar a, a, a metamorphosis took place then and there and he went to where the Prophet was staying at the home of Sayyidina Arqam and knocked the door and Hazrat Hamza came out and he became apprehensive of his intentions but he declared Shahada and the companions you know they said Allahu Akbar and the whole city of Makkah heard the voice Allahu Akbar and since then Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu who had the honor of being one of those for whom the Prophet والسلام, used to pray Allahumma ayyid al-Islam bi ahad al-Umarayn O oh Allah support Islam the call of Islam the call of my mission with the with the embracing of Islam by one of the two Umars the other Umar was Umar ibn Hisham better known as Abu Jahl these two were prominent renowned reputed members of the Jahili society and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted the prayer of the Prophet in favor of Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab and he was given the status of Siddiq. Uh, I am under warning that the time is running out. I would like to share with you a very interesting uh, comparison which the great philosopher of India, Muslim philosopher Shah Waliullah, has made between the personalities of Sayyidina Umar and Sayyidina Abu Bakr, the two nearest companions of the Prophet who were closest to him all the during all the important significant stages of the Prophet's mission and they were his advisors, his lieutenants, his consultants and his best friends and they were both uh, characterized as Siddiq and the term Siddiq has uh, a Quranic origin when we recite in Surah Al-Fatiha, Aydina Salaam Al-Mustaqeem, Salaam Al-Lazeen An'amta Alayhim, show us the straight path, the path of those on whom your favor has descended. So this is interpreted in the light of another verse which says, فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّقِينَ So Siddiq is a category just next to the Prophet a Siddiq is defined as someone who is totally identified with the mission of a Prophet. 
his own you know cognitive system becomes totally transformed in such a way that he perceives things and experiences things just at the same <clears throat> level almost at the same level at which the prophet does that is why we know that hazrat umar suggested many things and later quran was revealed to confirm and to endorse the suggestion of sayyidina umar and that is why the prophet also said if there were a prophet after me it would have been umar ibn khattab so this comparison between abu bakr and umar you know is an important comparison and this also shows that in the teaching of the prophet or in the manner of his training the companions he did not impose on all and sundry the same formula of reform in training rather the prophet took full cognizance of the individuality the exceptional talent the singularity of every individual and he at the same time you know maintained that individuality that individual predilection that individual taste because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created every individual as unique just as he has created us all of us with so many common features and traits maybe if we make a list of the common commonalities of individuals it will be a long list and if we make another list of individualities or singularities or distinctive traits of every individual then every individual will be different and it will be also a long list so the prophet treated everyone according to his level according to his temperament according to his tendency according to his taste and according to shah waliullah perhaps one of the greatest miracles of the prophet is that he reformed the individual so effectively so totally in such a short time neither before nor afterwards such a total change in the lives of individuals at such a large scale has taken place as was achieved by the prophet this is one of his foremost miracles according to shawadullah so he says that human temperament can be categorized can be classified into different kinds but for this purpose for the purpose of comparing the two greatest siddiqs abu bakr and umar who are also very close to the prophet even now in in rosa mubarak <coughs> and who will rise together on the day of judgment so he says that in arabic there are two types of temperaments one are according to him ashabu istilah istilah is derived from sulh swad lam he so is by istilah he means that there are individuals who can easily you know make a reconciliation make a harmonization between their own desires their own urges and the will of allah there is not much conflict you will notice in your life there are people you know who easily adopt a pattern and follow it consistently it is not very difficult for them to tame themselves or train themselves to a certain pattern of life once you convince that this is the healthy way of living this is the moderate way of life then they pursue that quite easily their inner self or their lower self does not come in the way does not hinder their spiritual or physical progress
So they are termed by Shah as Ashabu Istilah. And he gave, gave many examples and illustrations from the life of Sayyidina Abu Bakr to show that he was Sahibu Istilah. As soon as he heard that Wahi has come and the Prophet has declared that he is Messenger of Allah, he missed no moment to testify. That is why, that is why among males, he is the first companion. Among females, Sayyidah Khadija, in fact, if you uh, ask me, then the very first uh, moment is Sayyidah Khadija. But among males, it is Sayyidina Abu Bakr. So there was no problem. His, his inner self, or his lower self, or his animal self, Every human being is a combination of angelic and animalistic self and a struggle goes on between the two. So those who can easily, you know, subdue their animality and give <coughs> captaincy of their ship of life to their higher angelic disposition, they are called as Habu Salah and they remain consistent and there is no problem with them. The second category uh, according to Shah Walibullah is called Ashabu At-Tajazub. Tajazub means a certain kind of tension and conflict. I know that it is good to rise early, to go for a walk in the early morning, to pray Fajr in, in a mosque, and to take exercise and to organize my time and manage my affairs but you know something in me always resists i know that it is good to help the poor to work for social welfare but some inner self you know always impels me to desist and this makes my task difficult for this constant struggle. But he says the one who is from the second category, when he conquers his inner self or his animal self or his biological self and gives prominence to his higher angelic self, then he gets a sudden boost. <coughs> you know, <coughs> it is like a the rocket fired in the sky and suddenly his spirituality is elevated and it goes to the top because he has already conquered a big monster within himself and who has been subordinated totally to the will of Allah Hazrat Umar was one of those that is why he was resisting so hard the mission of the Prophet he was in the foremost in the forefront of those who were opposing, he even went to the extent of deciding to kill the Prophet But when he managed somehow with the Prophet's prayer, with Allah's guidance, with his own will and sincere desire, you know, his, he went like a rocket to the highest stations of loving Allah, loving the Prophet, and he testified in evidence this love by every action. And he was also at the same time, you know, and because of this, a, a very uh, unique combination of emotion and rationality. Remember, again, this attitude is illustrated. Sorry if I take two more minutes. At the time of the death of the Prophet, والسلام, if you remember, the, the reaction of Sayyidina Abu Bakr and the reaction of Sayyidina Umar were different. You know, you can imagine the shock of the Muslims when they learned of the demise of the Prophet. There cannot be a big, bigger shock, bigger grief possible to imagine. And it shook everyone. But what was the response of Sayyidina Abu Bakr? He stood up and addressed the grieved community of the faithful and said, Man kana ya'budu Muhammadan fa inna Muhammadan qadmat. 
those who used to worship Muhammad, let them know that Muhammad has died. And those who worship Allah should know that Allah is living. He never dies. Look how easily, how quickly he absorbed the shock and gave precedence and priority and superiority to his faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What was the reaction of Sayyidina Muhammad? He said, those who said that Muhammad has died, I will kill him. You know, I have a, a, a different interpretation of this statement of Sayyidina Umar, which is generally made. By this, perhaps he meant that those who are trying to rejoice the enemies, the munafiqeen, that with the physical absence of the Prophet, his mission has died, he will kill him. He will kill him. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, we wish we had more time to benefit from the wealth of knowledge of Dr. Muhammad al-Azali. Inshallah, we hope to have him in future events and inshallah, I'm sure we can all meet him whoever needs to ask him any questions again. We'd like Dr. Nazim al to come and conclude the session with a few words and also present the shield of our appreciation for Dr. al-Azali's time. So, Dr. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Dr. Al-Azali is a very distinguished scholar it's always a pleasure to have him amongst us. We pray for his help. I can assure him, as Shifa, you are in good hands. After listening to Dr. Al-Zali, what my personal opinion, since I'm associated with education, I think the basic purpose, the basic requirement for everyone, for every child should be proper and good education. A child is like an uncut diamond. How he or she becomes a gem with the help of his or her teachers. So this is just my message. And thank you once again for being here, Dr. Zali. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen.